Jesus said so much about so many things that he cared about. And Jesus said absolutely nothing about same-sex relationships. Absolutely nothing. I'm super excited about our new series, Assumptions, because it's a lot like the series that we've been doing on this channel for many years now, but instead of me sitting down and speaking with the guests individually, we get to see what the guests would speak about when speaking with each other. And this new series is fronted by our producer, Nicole. Hey y'all, um, yes, I changed my hair. I'm <laughs> just getting a little bit more normal. I don't have green hair, I don't have pronouns anymore. So let's get <laughs> that all out of the way. I'm super excited for this episode of Gay Pastors. We get super deep, so let's get into it. Gay pastors don't exist. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> we do exist. However, mm. if you ask me right now, name 10 more, I'd be a little stumped. That are out. That are out, mm -hmm. that not just that <laughs> I, cause you know, you know, I know some, I know some gay pastors, <laughs> um, but that are out right. uh, living in that freedom. Gay pastors do exist, but I don't know if y'all think, I don't think there's a lot. I also think that if you don't know one, yeah. you might not know. Yeah, I, th I think for me culturally as a black man, I think um, the numbers are really small. And I sometimes also say, you know, me being a pastor is not just saying gay pastor. I'm a pastor. Right. I'm a person first. And I think that for me is like most important. Gay pastors shouldn't come out if they're already preaching. So I was a pastor uh, at 26, I became a pastor mm -hmm. at like an evangelical mega church. Wow. Very laser fog machines. It was very fantastic. <laughs> um, but I was not out. Um, and so I spent the first um, handful of years as a pastor yeah. not out. Um, have you all been, the whole time that you've pastored, have you also been out or what? I came out when I was 18. Um, that was a long time ago. We love to see it. Well, it, was, it was a long time ago. <laughs> I've been ordained only since 2017. I spent the majority of my 20s still trying to wrap my brain around the fact that God didn't hate me because I was gay. Yeah. Wow. So I was a long way, like I was wrestling with that and how my sexuality related to my Christianity mm -hmm. and, and, and if it did. It's been a journey for me. I did not start off out. Um, I started preaching when I was 15 years old. Although I knew in second grade that there was something different about me, mm -hmm. I also knew, you know, keep that under wraps. Because, you know, I'm playing with my sisters and we're playing church, but instead of me being the preacher, I'm trying to be the first lady. Like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> with the hat on. The <laughs> I love because I would been in church all my life and enjoyed church as a young kid, I started preaching as a young child. You know, I fell into what I thought was my closest way of getting to God. So I'm also a late bloomer, but I didn't even know I was gay until mm -hmm. I was like 26, 27. Mm, wow. And purity culture was like, had a chokehold on yeah. our lives. And so I grew up my whole life thinking, not knowing I was gay because I felt like I was just being a good Christian because I had zero temptation to have sex with boys. So like literally like, I was like, oh my God, I am, Zero. I'm just good at this. Like I am <laughs> killing it. It's crazy. Like all my friends, I remember in college, all my friends would be like, oh, it's so hard to like keep our little, like, you know, cause every year we're at camp signing those purity pledges. <laughs> and every year my friends are breaking them, crying, you know? And I was like, wow. you just don't pray enough. <laughs> you, oh, I, how does it feel to be God's favorite? I, I'll let you know. Other queer people don't want to be around gay pastors. You weren't a pastor at the time, but like after you came out, you're like, yeah, you, you experienced that break where you're like, can I be free? Can I be me and have this? Because yeah. it's like, it's such a part of who I am. My faith and spirituality is everything, but so is who I am. Yeah, and being, being uh, uh, a young queer person and trying to say to your friends, like, yeah, and I'm having try, trying to have a relationship with Jesus too. And they're like, what? Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like girl, you're, why? You're, you're doing what? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, really, yeah. no. And they're <laughs> and not, not really understanding because especially when I was in my 20s, that was like, what? no, the, the church wants nothing to do with you. And right. why would you, why would you even try that? Yeah. There's nothing but hurt to come from that. Yep. But what I never expected in that journey was as I was trying so hard to find out how to be my most full and authentic Christopher, 
how people around me felt that they couldn't be their authentic selves exactly. around me because suddenly now, because I was on this journey with Jesus, I was going to start judging them. I'd be out and would meet somebody and think, oh, this is a great guy. And you know, you start talking and what do you do? What do you do? Oh, well, I do this right now, but you know, I'm a year away from being ordained a priest. Literally walk away. <laughs> the assumption that you can't be you if you're with me, yeah. we're scrutinized more. Mm -hmm. There's way more attention paid yeah. to what my dating life was like, even before I was an ordained person, but on my journey and serving in congregations, yeah. then I could feel they're paying attention more to what I'm doing and how I'm living my life. Yeah. I would look at my straight single colleagues or friends who were moving through the process and not see them get questioned yeah. the way I would get questioned. The Bible does not support homosexuality. Well, I mean, <laughs> everyone, everyone oh inhales. Uh, perfect. This is the thing we say all the time in our community is like, we take the Bible seriously, not literally. Also, the word homosexuality wasn't in the Bible until 1942. Yeah. Some American ass people added it. That's not, okay. So, yeah. this is like, we're on like language 19 by the time we're reading our English Bible. So, everybody <laughs> chill. But I do Amen. think that the, the narrative arc of, of scripture is so beautiful because it's exactly what you said. The story is always meant to get bigger. So if you can't handle the experience of that, you need to go somewhere. I also love when people get on like Jesus for like family values. I'm like the queer man who never married or dated anyone and just <laughs> walked around with his 12 best friends is about family values and right. family. Anyways. <laughs> Did not. When it comes to the Bible, I think there's, again, assumptions. And I think people don't dig a deeper enough. And even when it talks about, you know, man should not live, lie with man as a woman, uh, I thought it was very interesting because in, in Hebrew is uh, for man is ish. So instead of it saying ish shall not lie with ish, it says Zakar is Zakar is a male prostitute. And it is is these limited ideas of people just reading texts literally that is saying, Oh, you an abomination against God. No, I'm not an abomination of God. I'm not having sex with well, men and I'm not selling myself and using it as a way of worship or in the temple of God. No. The God that I believe is much bigger than a Bible. My God is liberty. My God he is non binary. I go back to the same thing every time. Jesus said so much about so many things that he cared about. And Jesus said absolutely nothing about same-sex relationships. And are you telling me that this was such a hot button issue for Jesus that it just magically didn't appear in any of the, that they just forgot to mention that he talked about homosexuality? I don't buy it. Let's just say that 3,000 years ago, that's the way God thought. Okay, but God can change God's mind. God can grow and evolve. God, God is, is, everlasting and ever changing. Mm -hmm. So if we say that God can only ever perceive something one particular way, aren't we then saying that we're, we have the capacity to put God in some little God box? And I'm, I'm not at all saying, take it, chuck it out. My point is we have to look at that, understand what was going on at that time in that place and then filter it through. And how, what, how has the world changed since then? What's different since then? We're also not stoning people for adultery today. Gay pastors shouldn't date. Oh my God, that is the craziest. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think it's funny too, because it depends on what you're, what, what background you're coming from though, yeah. because especially when I tell people I'm a priest mm. and then I, and they see my wedding ring and mm -hmm. I can see the, the question mark bubble above their head. Like, how does this work? Obviously, I'm not saying gay pastors can't date. But what I do think is it would be hard to date if I was out here on the apps and they're like, oh, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm a pastor. He'd be like, crickets. <laughs> I'm not sure how I would date, but I could if I wanted to. Ooh. Let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> Here he comes, know, goes. Come on, come on, come on. So I, I think I'm at the table. I'm the single pastor at the table. <laughs> it is so many layers to dating as a pastor. And it's a lot of different people that you would meet and a lot of weird things that would happen. <laughs> And I tell you the apps I tried it, they don't they don't work. So I've hired like a dating coach, you know, to try to help me, you know, navigate through. And it still is like 
an interesting thing and it's complex um, because you're trying to help people understand what it means to be gay and a pastor. Mm -hmm. But our people will become so clam up and like, yeah. oh, I can't cuss. Oh, I can't. I was like, okay. I'm not Jesus or God. Like, <laughs> I need to be touched too. I really want to dismiss the whole assumption. Like, I think yeah. dating is a part of getting out of your space, mm -hmm. meeting new people. And I think we're not meant to be alone. I think we're all relational people. So I need it. Gay pastors should inform their congregation when they're dating someone new. Yeah, I think that we are pioneering something to me that hasn't been done before. And at Vision Church Los Angeles, my congregation is predominantly um, black and we are still working through uh, the mystique of a pastor. Um, yes. yeah. And for them culturally, who I date matters to them. And so they want to get into every facet of it. They even want to approve it, which mm -hmm. first of all, it should be my choice, not your choice. And it, it, it's, it's, it's such a difficult thing because you're, you're first asking a person to first learn me without putting the part, the title of pastor on it. Mm -hmm. You just know me first right. and then we can get to the pastor portion, but it kind of leads before you get there. Where do I allow my level of intimacy to lie, but also maintain the mystique of a pastor? Right. All pastors practice celibacy. So personally, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I feel like this assumption that uh, pastors are celibate, priests, even, you know, with that title even adds another layer, I think is antiquated. And I think it points to a big issue that we see a lot in our church is breaking down the assumptions that were put on a lot of us by purity culture, yeah. right? So none of our pastors are celibate or asked to be celibate. But also, we do not live in a world where we assume ain't nobody having sex before marriage. Right. Like, while I don't think purity culture is the answer and saying don't have sex before marriage, I also don't think the other answer is do whatever you want, whenever right. you want. Yes. And so a conversation that we have in our community regularly is how do you develop a healthy sexual ethic as a person in Los Angeles in 2023. If the divinity of, of God is in you and is in every other person, which is something we believe, then how do you treat them? And I think those are just things that the church has done such a bad job of talking about, but things that we're always thinking about. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, like 100%. sex and money, we're thinking about most of the day and we're not, we're not talking about them? You know, God did not create us to be like utilitarian creatures that are just here to make more human beings, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's a reason that sex is pleasurable, right? Yeah. And God desires for us to have pleasure. Yeah. What God also desires from us is to be respectful and uh, kind and compassionate. Mm -hmm. And if people are consenting adults and it's life-giving to them, yeah. Yeah. then why shouldn't that be celebrated? When we make it our business to impose rules for the sake of control, because let's be honest, that's what that's all about. Yes. It's about control, and it's especially about controlling women. Yes. But God is not about control. God is not the puppet master, right? But when we're talking about intimacy and being uh, sexual beings, yeah. it's part of who we are. We're not serving anybody yeah. with that. Sex before marriage makes women impure. It's funny as a pastor who is, uh, you know, leading this community and so much of the work is undoing what we learned in other churches. Yes, we are a church, but we're undoing what you learn specifically for uh, the women in our community. Women and, and queer people in our community have just been under such shame around their sexuality. I literally remember because they would separate the girls and the boys, mm -hmm. <laughs> very binary. There was like a male youth pastor who's probably 21 and he has a cup of water. He passes around every single girl, spits in the cup of water. And then at the end, he holds it up and he says, now who would want to drink this? Mm. Okay. <laughs> That is intriguing. Uh, okay. <laughs> and if you think I'm I'm 37 still being like, what the hell was that? That's what they're telling girls. So it's not a wonder that straight, queer, all the women don't feel like they can experience pleasure, don't know how to experience pleasure. And if we think for one second that our bodies, our physical expression, our embodiedness, our sexuality, our experience sexuality is not a fundamental part of this divine design, 
then we're joking with ourselves. So it is, it's just such a big part of our work to start to say, undo that and say like, how do you get in your body? How can you reclaim the parts of your body that some 21 year old named Chad try to have you spit in a cup and take away? If you're Christian, you shouldn't have queer sex. The black church made sex very taboo. And that whole purity concept and culture was for the girls, the women, and the guys, we didn't talk about it. What was they telling y'all? Because we were we doing all the most. They were telling us nothing. We were listening to each other. We were learning from each other. No more than saying, like, you shouldn't have sex. Mm -hmm. But that's it. And that's when we learned about sex, really, among each other. Not really somewhere in church really sitting down and talking about the beauty of it, mm -hmm. or the connectivity of it, or... We just heard the abomination, or you're going to hell. And then if you bring queer inside of it, they don't even use the Man. word queer. You know, it's like the weirdo. The, the, or the, the spirit of homosexuality. It's like, oh, uh, or they would say the craziest thing. And, and to me, like, oh, if you're going to be queer, then I hope that you will bleed out your behind. Like, really? It was trauma working through sex, trauma working through what it means to love it and embrace it. And that's why now I am so about sex positivity, my responsibility is to help you navigate through your choices when it comes to sex. Just like I have to navigate through my choices, you have to navigate through your choices. And don't see me as super spiritual either. I'm a human just like you. I want to be touched just like you, you know, but I also have to think about it. I'm on prep. You need to be on prep too, yeah. because I want to see you live. The three of us sitting here is kind of a miracle because a, lo a lot of you guys didn't make it. Did not. You know? Like, we are paving a way. We are pioneers. We are creating something that hasn't been done. We are also saying that God is just not one dimensional. Women can't be pastors. First of all, women can be pastors. I want to say that because I am very passionate about it at, at my church uh, because I grew up in a, a church that predominantly was women. The patriarchy, the misogyny, the sexism is so baked into a lot of mainstream evangelical Christianity, it's its almost unrecognizable without it. So even in the, the church that I first became a pastor at, it was one of those churches, it was like very Hillsong-y in that like, if you didn't look too hard, you're like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. They're so accepting. They're so loving. Like, But he would say all the time, like, I think women can be pastors, not senior pastors, but women can be pastors. And everyone was like, you're amazing. <laughs> like everyone was like, wow, so progressive. Yeah, I've spoken at camps where I could speak, not behind the pulpit from the side stage. I've spoken at places where I could speak, but I couldn't serve communion. I've spoken at places. And by the way, like this is at Georgia, 1960. I worked in this church in LA like five years ago. Okay, this is not. Wow. <laughs> and I think it's the same reason why we see these very qualified, very talented, uh, very, again, qualified women running for president. And then everyone gets in that box and you realize we still don't value women, not even close. We still not cannot fathom a woman had any sort of power and authority. So the idea that this these strong women can come in and they're gonna actually lead, oh, I think we are we are quite farther than we think from that. Yeah. I don't think I would be a priest right now if it weren't for the women clergy that I know. Every every turning point in my journey came at the instigation of a woman pastor that I know. And, you know, and I'm sitting here, you know, listen, I'm sitting here as the white guy at the table, right? We're so afraid of anyone who doesn't look like me yeah. having the power because what does that mean to me right. if I'm number two? Mm -hmm. right. And I think that's the craziest fear. It's a, it's a completely two. irrational fear. What it makes me is it makes me a lot happier is the, 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 the <laughs> honest answer to that, that question. Is yeah. It makes me a lot happier. Okay. Gay clergy should not be allowed around children. Well, obviously I disagree with that statement. Children's ministry and youth ministry is really important to me. When I first came to the congregation that I'm serving right now and I was named as the rector, people withdrew their children from our preschool. And I was sort of like silly and innocent. And I was like, oh, well, I'll just reach out to them. And, you know, okay, well, they don't know me. I'm a great guy. You know, they don't know me. Right. But, and I'll reach out to them and they'll get to know me and they'll be like, oh, he's okay. You know, whatever. Yeah. They, they wouldn't even acknowledge that I reached out to them. 
So it's it's very real that that thing that people judge about gay people, queer people, and children. Mm-hmm. It it's obviously ir- irrational and illogical. We also have to hold in tension the very real abuse that many children have suffered at the hands of clergy folk, but not necessarily queer clergy people. I think we should always be doing everything we can to protect vulnerable people, especially children. When people think they know something because they know something about you, they think they know you. Mm -hmm. I know that guy's gay. I don't want my kid around him. But you don't know Christopher. Right. You just you just heard something about me and made a whole lot of assumptions about me based on a fact about my life. That is makes me super angry mm-hmm. and brokenhearted. The Bible does not support trans people. No, I I'll die on this hill because I think the <laughs> I think the Bible supports trans people and is a is an advocate for trans people even more so than than any other thing i think the the linchpin of scripture is the resurrection story of jesus yeah. which is uh birth life death rebirth which is leaving as one person coming back as another we saw that with saul and paul where these people are actually changing their names by the way and coming back as different people the entire narrative of the life of jesus rests on this idea that you will be able to uh, die to the thing that you were, mm-hmm. arrive at something new, and then that new thing will create more space for the spirit. So I think our our trans siblings are widely represented in scripture. I think they are a, can I cuss? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think they are a f- gift to any community. And I think our the, the trans and non-binary folks who are in our community, I'm grateful for every day because they allow us to expand our understanding of God. They are such a necessary part of the story. And I go with you 100% um, because I believe that we are more spirit than we are flesh. This mm-hmm. body is just only a house of our spirit. Without our spirit, this body goes back to the dust. And I think if we embrace our spirituality more than how we show up through this human body, mm-hmm. we can see trans people as a person, a spirit, a person that is here by God's dem- demand and purpose, and that their truth does not in no way infringe upon my truth. Our truth sometimes is about transformation. And when we 100% accept ourselves without all of the noise that is outside of us, we may discover something unique and different about us that is beyond the male limited view, our female limited view as well. The major issue I believe people have with it because it's different. It is unusual, it's out of the norm, and why would you dare change your body or change the process of what is supposed to be acceptable? My job as a pastor to that trans person is to speak to their spirit, to speak to that person's understanding and knowing that your life matter, your ministry matter, your purpose matter, your calling matter. I see you because a lot of times they are not seen. I hear you. A lot of times they are not heard. And I'm not here to even bring your life in danger. To be trans is also a dangerous Dangerous, choice. You could be walking on the street and your life could be taken just for walking on the street in your fullness. The amount of trans women that are still dying today is insane. I was just at a black tie event and they did a tribute to trans people. And they did one also to Queer Black Men. The Queer Black Men video uh, tribute was probably like a minute. But when they got to the trans tribute, it went on for almost three minutes of pictures and pictures of trans men, trans women who are dead today. And it wasn't a lot of trans people who were like 40, 50, 60. This was like 18, 20, and like at the top of your 30s that are leaving us every day. And every time I see that for me and I hear that, like, no, I need to be out here as much as I can galvanizing the fact that their life matter and they should be treated as humans because they are human and not inhumane. Mission work is always beneficial. (laughs) I have personally been a part of some that was not. 
I so I grew up super even though I went to a Christian college. Mm. Like the assumption was that you went on a mission trip every summer. And I did not one ounce of good. Probably only bad. When I think of mission work, I think of all the white people at my college that were like called to Africa. And I'm like, you're not <laughs> called to Africa. Everyone can't be called to Africa. Do you know how many white girls in the San Gabriel Valley right now are walking around with Africa continent tattoos on the ankles that they got after their six weeks in Ghana? So it just, uh, I, I feel like I have this like such a negative idea of missions in my head because it's this very white paternalistic, I need to go, I need to take pictures with these babies, with the swollen bellies, I put it on my Facebook and I need to like feel good about myself. Mm. Um, and so I do not think missions work is always beneficial. However, I do think mission is critical to and service to how you live your life as a person of faith. Was, <laughs> as soon as you asked that question, I, I, I felt my back, like, yeah. <laughs> because it's just this, it's this whole thing of let's go, you know, it, it sounds like we're going to do good work, but what we're really going to do is try to make the rest of the world like us. Mm -hmm. And that to me is, there's no possible way that that can be life giving. If you're going someplace because you've identified a need and you've brought you, Either that community has come to you and said, here's something we need or some place we want to go. Can you can you collaborate with us? Yeah. Okay. Okay. But when our when we're we're hiding behind a project, but what our real agenda is is to go make Christians or go yeah. turn people, make people more like us, that's that's Bad, bad, bad. I would love that you made the comment about building a school because what I was thinking about in my head was, oh yeah, we're going to go somewhere. We're going to build a, a medical center. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it doesn't matter that you don't have any doctors, but we built you a medical center. You have all other kinds so, of healers and all this stuff. Isn't like, that great? Don't you love a hospital? <laughs> right. right. Like, like, oh, like, no. You know, like, look at what we did for you, mm -hmm. but we never asked for that. Well, what about we did it? I, I just grew up where... They saw mission as like giving money over to Africa. That was the mission and they were shot about that. And actually going over there and doing the work is like going to Africa to get the experience of being in Africa because I'm originally from Africa. Uh, but when I uh, really came out, I kind of reclaimed my mission is getting my hand dirty and getting in the work that I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. uh, like one of our mottos is no one would do life alone. And within our community, uh, there are a lot of people who are wrestling with loneliness um, and are suffering at home, particularly when it was, uh, the pandemic uh, hit people hard in a way you 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 could you could go anywhere. You was at home, and some people was at home by themselves. And then you at home with your mind, and you wrestling with shall I live, shall I not? You know, and no one's calling you, no one is texting you, and, and it's rough. And so for me, my mission work was let's create community. Let's create groups or something, somebody to check on people, to stop by your house, send you something in the mail just to let you know, I see you, I hear you. You know, that for me became the mission. And so for me, I just had to reclaim mission because yeah. at first I didn't fully see the benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, that's my mission. What advice do you have for young queer Christians? Number one question I get from folks exploring is, do I have to choose my sexuality or my spirituality? Can I have both? I feel like the big question I had was like, do I have to choose like my the vision for my life and my, you know, calling, I hate that word, but I can't think of another one, as a pastor or my spiritual or my sexuality. And so it's just nice to be like, yeah, you know, you don't, there's, there's no choices anywhere. I push myself really hard to have answers, mm -hmm. you know, like just as like a person in the world, I'm always trying to really know things. And because I feel like people expect me, I'm the guy standing in front of them every Sunday. I feel like they expect me to have answers for them. And I don't, so often I'll sit getting ready for, you know, whatever my sermon is going to be on Sunday. And I'll be like, I don't know what to say about this. I don't, you know, and I've got tools in my toolbox to figure it out. But I just, I loved the, the listening part of this experience today and hearing your stories and your struggles like you say you know, like feeling that like oh wait i'm not the only person dealing mm -hmm. with yeah. all of that